As you might remember, Parasite in 3D was a notable hit for Charles Band and Embassy Pictures in 1982, and his follow-up would continue both his willingness to have things thrown at his camera in the magic of three dimensions, as well as his habit of smushing two popular film genres together. With Metal Storm, the destruction of Jared Sin, we once again are in desert wasteland Mad Max territory. But instead of melding with body horror, we have vehicular carnage mashing up with Star Wars space fantasy, with a bit of western on the side. And yes, in 1983, I imagine Mad Max meets Star Wars was the easiest pitch in the world. It's a sci-fi desert wasteland filled with cool, boxy cars that look like they came out of the old Mask cartoon. But this also sits uneasily with hokey religions, ancient weapons, and uh, this thing. Now, just to make sure we never forget how awesome The Road Warrior is, Band even managed to get one of the stars from that film to appear as Jared Sin. No, not that one. <laughs> Definitely not that one. Nope. Yeah, that guy, Michael Preston. He's magical and controls some sort of crystal that traps souls, as well as being a despotic, tyrannical ruler of the wasteland. And he gets to say things like, We'll be kings of our land again. Forever! <laughs> so our leather-bound, distinctly Mel Gibson-y lead is Jeffrey Byron, who looks appropriately sunburnt and spaghetti westerny as Space Ranger Dojin. He's arrived on the planet Lemuria to track down Jared Sin, and he gets to drive the boxiest and therefore most awesome vehicle. While traveling across the planet, he runs into Diana, played by future Golden Raspberry winner and current wife of John Travolta, Kelly Preston. Her father has just been murdered by Jared Sin's half-robot son, Ball. And she'll be the spunky love interest for Dojin, though she soon gets whisked away via magic and vanishes for three quarters of the movie. So Ball is awesome. He has a robot arm that extends and sprays green acid on anyone who gets in his way. Frankly, in a world full of laser guns, randomly spewing acid maybe isn't that impressive, but still, just look at him. So Diana is taken by Jared Sin, who sends this sparkly creature to attack Dojin. He fights him off, of course, and then heads to the nearby mining town to track down Rhodes, an alcoholic ex-soldier played by Tim Thomerson, and that's a name I'm going to be mentioning a lot as I do these videos. You see, this is the last film before Empire International Pictures is actually formed, and while there are a few familiar faces here, like Richard Maul, aka Bull from Night Court, we need to talk about a guy who's going to be very important for both Empire and Full Moon Pictures over the next 20 years. In the late 70s, Tim Thomerson was a working actor and comedian, appearing in movies like Robert Altman's A Wedding and Car Wash, but here he plays a Han Solo-ish ex-soldier who helps Dojin find his way to the Lost City. In a couple of years, Band would give Thomerson his most recognizable role, and their collaboration would continue up to present day. Here, he has a Paul Weller haircut, and he's really the only good guy with much of a personality. The pair head into the Cyclopean territory, where Dojin steals this wonky mask in a brief Indiana Jonesy interlude, where the two almost get attacked by Graboids, before they run into Richard Maul and his gang of one-eyed marauders. If you guessed that Dojin would have to face Maul's Horrock in a Kirk slash Spock Psy battle, you'd be right. Dojin prevails, of course, and wins the Cyclopeans' respect and the ability to live. So Dojin and Rhodes attack Ball and his gang, which leads to a pretty nifty, if slow-moving car chase with plenty of vehicles falling off cliffs and exploding. Eventually, there's some hand-to-hand -hand combat where Rhodes gets taken out of action with some 3D niftiness, and Dojin and Ball have a confrontation that ends with this. <laughs> On his own, Dojin makes it to Sin's encampment and confronts him in front of a large group including Horrock and the Cyclopeans. Dojin testifies to the easily swayed crowd that Jared Sin is evil, which makes Sin blast him with his big crystal, which of course luckily gets deflected by that weird mask that Dojin stole. So from here, everything goes crazy. Horrock tangles with balls, stabbing him in the chest, that makes Jared Sin hop on a sky bike, seriously, and he's soon chased by Dojin in what is either the low light or the highlight of the film depending on your perspective. Eventually, Sin gets tired of the chase and opens up a portal into some sort of weird 2001 psychedelic craziness and vanishes. And that's it. Dojin returns to the camp and blows up Jared Sin's giant crystal with his laser gun and then reunites with Rhodes and Diana, certain that he'll have to face Jared Sin again someday. Metal Storm is big, goofy fun in the mold of Krull or Megaforce, and it's also, at a mere 84 minutes, almost comically short. It has a bit of a slow start, but as with so many things, once Tim Thomerson joins the fray, things really pick up. And despite its title, Jared Sin is never actually destroyed. Instead, Metal Storm, the destruction of Jared Sin, appears to set up a sequel that was never to actually arrive, coming at the tail end of the early 80s 3D revival, 
It failed to find an audience at the time, though has developed quite a cult reputation in the decades since. In fact, Scream Factory will be releasing a special edition Blu-ray featuring both a 2D and 3D version of the film in 2016. I guess the story had a happy ending after all. But for us, this is just the beginning. Frustrated with the difficulty of finding distributors for his work, Charles Band was to create his own theatrical distribution company in 1983, and Empire International Pictures was finally formed. Its first release? A film actually directed before Parasite. It's called The Alchemist, and we'll be talking about that next time.